Christmas season. You know, for a few weeks, there has been a lot of talk here in the States and around the world about the Syrian refugee crisis. And like every issue at hand, it quickly becomes polarized with people pandering to either side of the aisle. Now, I could have chatted about this right after the Paris bombings a few weeks ago when suddenly the refugee crisis was immediately the hot topic of discussion. You may think, John, why have you waited several weeks to talk about this? But my question is, why haven't we been talking about this for the past five years since the Syrian civil war has begun? There have been people in dire straits for years while we sat idly by, not just our government, but everybody has had their head in the sand. Anyway, everybody is now throwing their opinion around, and some people would say that we need to let them into our countries as a safe haven. Others say that to bring them in gives radical Islamic terrorists open access through our borders. Now look, my goal is not to get politically charged this week, it just gets frustrating to see an issue that no one has even thought about immediately get filtered into the file folder of either the knee-jerk liberal or conservative reaction, where your perspective gets drafted for you depending on whether you're a Democrat or Republican, or whether you listen to James Dobson or Brian McLaren. You know, there's a great quote often attributed to Winston Churchill, but probably came from someone else. He said, if you're not a liberal by the time you're 25, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative by the time you're 35, you have no brain. Is it possible that everybody is actually a bit right in this situation? Look, Jesus was a refugee. I want to talk about that this week. The scripture is clear that we are to help refugees. If you don't have a heart to help these people, then you are a cold, callous prick. There is also some common sense needed in how do we actually do that because there are countless religious nut job zealots who want to blow us all to hell. And if you're kidding yourself about that, drinking the psychotropic CNN Kool-Aid that tells you 99% of all Muslims want to take windy walks together and don't really believe the Quran's crystal clear admonition to disembowel you, then you are living in a fantasy world only Walt Disney could have dreamed of. See, I don't claim to be an expert in all of this, but it does hit home to me in a number of ways. Because, look, I understand the need for having filters, buffers. I deal with religious, moralizing maniacs of the so-called Christian persuasion all the time who actually think they'd be doing God a favor by burning me at the stake. The bloodlust in their eyes, the fuming, venomous hatred spilling out of their mouths as they've cursed me, damned me to hell, not just in cowardly private messages, but brazenly picketing outside of my meetings. Dude, I understand the hardened heart of a religious zealot firsthand more than most. I haven't had my head cut off, but I do face more persecution than most do on this side of the pond. And I'm not saying all Muslims are terrorists, but with bloodthirsty religious maniacs, you've got to have boundaries. I I mean, on a really small scale, my block button saves me a world of headache. By the way, if you are a spy watching this video this week out of spite right now, just to see what I'm saying uh, so you can report on it, but you're one of those people who I've actually had to block on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, etc. And believe me, I have blocked hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Well, look, there is hope for you, my uh, dear beloved spies. There is now a support group online at... John Crowder blocked me.com. It's a great place to commiserate with others like you who feel they should be entitled to rant, pick fights, and start arguments on my own social pages. But evil, fascist, censoring John Crowder just wouldn't give you the freedom to publicly attack him anymore and hijack his platform. Boo-hoo, you who have been blocked. Uh, I had the audacity to do it. So go visit the website. But look, now I digress. <laughs> but not really. Because what I'm saying is that boundaries are okay. Borders are okay. Selfishness is not okay. 
I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm not a politician. Whether there needs to be some kind of strict vetting process before someone is allowed in past the borders and how you could pull that off on such a massive scale, I have no idea. It's just conjecture. All I know is that the pandering and the polarization needs to stop. It is possible to use both our hearts and our brains. Otherwise, if we just make this another double-minded partisan argument, those same partisan lines that also run through the church as well, then we are going to lose our ability to make sound judgments because wisdom has two sides. Love takes risks. I mean, how is this for using one's brain? You know, last summer, I took a team. We went right to the Syrian border, ministering to and feeding the refugees right in the heart of ISIS country. I mean, I've been there handing out the food, loving the broken. I have friends who live there constantly making a real tangible difference. I mean, here I am, a six and a half foot white guy with a target on my back, bringing a team of pale faces right into the lion's den. I was packing no heat, no bulletproof vest. There was no squadron of Pentecostal security guard ushers with earpieces watching over me. I just had a little something called the Holy Ghost. I was drinking something called love stronger than death. And look, plus, at the end of the day, I'm not afraid of Muslims. I honestly love them. I don't even see Muslim or Buddhist or Christian. I just see a humanity that's been included in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The boundaries are erased from my perspective. All the cheeks pinch the same. All the smiles are toothy when you pop them out of somebody. There are no boundaries or borders in my heart. I am also aware that you can't wave a magic wand so that everybody drops their explosives and farts rainbows and unicorns and we all have a picnic in a lollipop forest together. On a political level, look, scripture's pretty darn clear. God allows rulers to have authority. Now, I'm not getting into some divine right of kings or Augustine's just war. All I'm saying is that on a very practical level, there are dangers to society. I also understand the dilemma, the necessity for political vetting processes. We can't just throw our heads under a rock and pretend that there aren't plenty of people who view themselves at war with the West. I mean, that's like me posting my private cell phone number in Charisma Magazine and not expecting some nut job hyper Arminian to heap verbal abuse on my message machine. On a personal level, I should have a love that will take me right into the heart of darkness. But I also have a responsibility to protect the innocent and not let the fox into the hen house. There is a double-sided tension here. But if you don't look at both sides honestly, justice will not really be served. We need to help the refugee and we need to do it wisely, but we need to do it. What frustrates me are the keyboard warriors who moan about the government not doing anything, or the church as if the church is some other entity beside yourself. Well, what the hell are you doing? I mean, what are you waiting for? There are always opportunities to help. Somehow we bought into this ridiculous notion that liking a bitchy Facebook post is the same as actually tangibly helping someone out. I see my friends who are doing the real legitimate missionary work and, and at the height of hypocrisy is when they post some need for real hard cold cash on, on social media Media, and the post will get over a hundred or, or several hundred likes without a single dime actually clicking into their PayPal coffers, your thumbs up or thumbs down makes absolutely no difference. It means jack squat. Paul spoke of two ways you show the proof of love. You either go or you send someone who's going with real money. Your opinions don't change the world. As goes another classic quote, an opinion is like an anal sphincter. Everybody has one. No, your likes Dislikes and opinions are a smokescreen. What really matters is the difference you are tangibly making by getting off of your opinion and doing something about it. So look, this is the bottom line where I'm headed with this whole thing. Everybody has an opinion on what the powers that be should or should not be doing. It'll carry over into the elections and everything. And both sides are right and both sides are wrong. But they ultimately get stuck 
stymied in the quagmire of these opinions when on a personal one-on-one -on -one level, the burden falls on you and I, not the government, not your pastor. We live in a society of outrage because we forgot how to be a society of outreach. We know exactly how everyone else should fix the problems of the world, and therefore we actually contribute to the world's problems with our own lethal apathy. I want you to consider for a moment the plight of the first Christmas. We've dandled it all up with jingle bells and quaint nativity scenes, but we are talking about an intensely traumatic event. You've got a young girl already steeped in scandal with an out-of-wedlock pregnancy and a radically conservative culture that sentences people to capital punishment for less. And what's the bizarre out clause to explain it all away? Well, God made me pregnant. I mean, you've got to be kidding me. Now we've really heard it all. And then you have the sheer oppression of this dictator Herod who demands that this young couple uproot and travel at their own expense for a census reading, risking bandits, marauders, and highway robbers. And in her most vulnerable moment, not giving birth in the comfort of her own environment with friends and family, but literally in a barn full of animals and feces on the roadside outside some overcrowded trucker motel, Mary goes through the pains of childbirth, immediately having to still move on in transition miles from home. And in no time flat, this maniacal, genocidal, despot Herod gets wind of this prophetic word about a Messiah who's going to threaten his power, and he sends cutthroat murderers to literally commit infanticide, cutting babies down in their own blood, ripping children age two and under right from their mother's arms. I mean, this is the graphic brutality into which our Lord entered the world. Imagine the stress, the anxiety, the instability into which this young, vulnerable family was thrown as Joseph quickly had to evaluate his situation. Situation. And like so many Syrian and Iraqi and Palestinian refugees today, he had to just keep walking into the unknown as he fled to Egypt with no assurance of what was going to be around the corner, where he was going to get his next meal or feed his family, ejected from the security of loved ones and thrown into the chaos of an unknown world, speaking unknown tongues with no hope of charity or solace from a foreign people, except raw trust in God's provision alone. Let me tell you that whatever you do to the refugee, you have done it to Christ himself. Whatever you do to the least of these, the prisoner, the outcast, the poor, the hungry, this is the reality of Christmas. It's not the gingerbread reindeer or the eggnog or the snowman. It looks a lot more like the plight of the refugee. Through the course of his life, Christ was an exile, a refugee, a stranger in this world. And here he is in Bodied in the turbidity and the tension and the crisis of every wayfaring refugee, simply scraping to survive in this world, every fearful mother, every hungry screaming baby in her arm, every desperate father with no means to care for his own kin. So keep this in mind. Guys, this is not a guilt trip, but it's a moment of clarity that should inspire compassion. I'm sorry if I didn't pander to one side or another in this political debate, if I actually attempted to strike a note of balance, God forbid, we need wisdom, but we can't do nothing. Let's be the hands and feet of God's love in the world, okay? Look, this may not be a happy face ending of the Jesus trip this week. It is an exhortation. Go change the world. Booyah shaka. Now through December 15th, you can get 20% off everything in our online store, books, audio teachings, even our MP3 JoyPod player. Visit johncrowder.net and enter the discount code Xmas on checkout. You can pre-order John Crowder's upcoming new book, Money, Sex, Beer, God, a biblical companion to the happy life. All pre-orders will be signed and ship early 2016. Visit johncrowder.net to order. And in January, John will be in South Africa. 
He's coming to three cities, Johannesburg, Durban and Cape Town. Find out more at thenewmystics.com slash Africa. We also have several mystical schools coming up on the calendar. John will be in Bergen, Norway in January. He'll be in New York City in February. And he'll also be in Oklahoma City in February. Find all our mystical schools at thenewmystics.com slash schools. Next spring, we're rolling strong through the West Coast. March is our Northern California Mystical School in the Chico Redding area with special ministry school student discounts. Also in April, I'm back in Southern California with Tim Wright for our West Coast Gospel Mania Tour. It's also coming to Phoenix, Arizona, Portland, Oregon, and the Colorado Springs area. And in April, I am in Seattle for a mystical school and for our West Coast Canadian friends. I'm back in Vancouver, BC in May. These will all blow up, so lock in a seat early and tell your friends.